everybody, welcome to beautiful Belize. I am Frank Connolly, I'm the sustainability director here for Sanctuary Belize City River Wildlife Reserve. I'm shooting today here right in front of the savanna, which is this very unique ecosystem that we have as the heart and core of a conservation area that it makes up the City River Wildlife Reserve. The City River Wildlife Reserve is 14,000 acres. It is a bona fide land conservation trust, a nonprofit corporation, making up 14,000 acres. How big is that? 22 square miles. To give you some reference of how big that is, it's a Manhattan-sized piece of property that is set in conservation to protect a watershed that is off behind me here by about five, six miles, as well as all the way down the City River out to the beautiful Caribbean. And when you have the two dominant forces of nature, mountain and ocean, sitting in such close proximity to one another in this small 22 square mile area, an amazing amount of biodiversity and interdependent relationships play out. And it is our responsibility in putting this development together, a literal city in the jungle, to make sure that our environmental impacts are limited to the sense that we do not break up the interdependent relationships of all the things that are happening from the mountains all the way out to the sea. And I want to get into that with you in a little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, the, my background, how I came here, and that'll give you some context to the type of metrics that we are trying to preserve and making sure that we are able to take this beautiful, large-scale community, nestle it within a pristine nature reserve, and basically even maybe give some back to the community, give something back to nature. So where was I before I got here? And that is a critical question because that gave me the context in coming in to a place that was unspoiled. I, in 2007, I started a company called Peerless Green Initiatives, and basically we were de development contractors for groups like United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program, World Bank, IMF, these kind of intergovernmental uh, organizations who were specialized in going into very, very damaged ecosystems and damaged communities for one reason or another, whether it be natural calam calamity or political strife going into these areas and actually fixing something that was horribly broken. Let me give you a great example. When my company was in um, India, we had a job up in Udakon. Udakon is in the furthest northern reaches of India, and it's a beautiful area that is in the highland steppes, reminiscent very much of the mountains that we have here in Belize, where people have, for time immemorial, been participant and lived as tribals, as communities, as small villages in these mountains, taking only as much as they need, giving back to uh, nature what it needs in a, in a harmonic balance. Well, about 10 years ago, the government of India did something that sounds pretty good. They had taken and they drew a, a circle on the map and said, this forest is now going to be this beautiful conservation area in the highland steppes of the Himalayas. Sounds good, plus one for conservation, right? Well, as a draconian measure as, as part of that policy, Everybody that was in the uh, forest had to move out of the forest. So they dislocated about 20,000 people down into a valley, and that valley was where these people had to subsist for about a decade. So what did they do? They would go up into the hills into the night, they would poach a log from the forest, and they did this for about 10 years, taking one tree out at a time until and, and selling that tree on the black market so that they could feed their wife, feed their kids, feed their community, and just subsist. That is not sustainable. What ended up happening a few years ago, the lay cloud burst. A monumental biblical storm comes out of the Himalayas, dumps 10 inches of rain in one 24 hour period. That is more than most of us could absolutely uh, believe in as much rain could be falling at one time in one place. Well, what happens? When you remove the, the hardwoods from a forest, Trees do something more than just creating shade, more than just creating board foot length. It actually holds up hillsides. In this particular case, the entire hillside comes down on top of the village. What happens next? Companies like mine had to get involved to come in to the rescue to figure out how to get these, com these communities back on their feet. And it was a very, very learning experience for all of us in my group that were working there. We see a lot in media, we read a lot in media about the 
the people, planet, profit paradigm, three bottom line economics, sustainable economics. And that was a principal example of one that had not been planned out thoroughly from the beginning. And once that triangle of people, planet, and profit starts to degrade, once natural capital resources are taken for granted or have to be exploited in other, in, uh, for communities to be sustainable, then we find that how things break down. So with that kind of background, I came to this place, Sanctuary Belize. I was here on a consultation basis and I met Johnny Usher. Johnny Usher said, listen, I've done my homework on you. I know who you are. If you know what you're looking at here, you'll understand what you're seeing. You'll understand the vision that we are trying to incorporate. I understood it as soon as I got here, and it came very simply for me. Johnny handed me the keys to a Polaris, one of the little buggies that we run around in here, and he said, I'm not gonna tell you a word about this place. I'm gonna give you the keys to this Polaris. You go take a ride. You tell me what you think. So I was out here, out on the savannah, 4,000 acres of conservation area. I understood the mechanism of the savanna. It's basically the world's perfect water cartridge. I understood that the mountains that we have to the, to the west of us are basically the area where you get a tremendous amount of rainfall. We get about 90 inches of rain here on the plains. We get about 120 inches of rain up on the hills. And it conveys very slowly across this savanna. I understood why they were preserving it. I understood why Johnny thought it was, should be the conservation heart of this beautiful development. And it was while I was driving across there, moving out of the savanna, where it was a warm day like it is today, a little bit of a breeze blowing, warm, dry. As I'm coming into waterway villages, I start to drop down, and not over a course of miles, but a course of a couple hundred yards, was able to feel the difference and have small puffs of moist, cool air hitting me in the face in this open air Polaris. I got goosebumps, folks. Reason was I hadn't really been able to experience in very small parts of the world active microclimates that were acting out so quickly and so actively in a very compact area. So I was sold. I was sold on the idea that we had something here that was valid. There was five ecosystems. What are those five ecosystems? Well, one is this, as I've said, the savanna, which is this massive water cartridge. How does that work? Well, simply put, the savanna, although you look at it and you see grasses and you look at it in the rainy season and you can fly over it and you'll see water, is actually very, very compact. It's actually impervious clay. So what ends up happening is when water channels across the savanna, it cannot permeate, it cannot percolate down into the soil and instead has to convey its way horizontally across the soil. And what happens is all these very specialized grasses that you see here in these palmettos basically have a root system that is completely designed to live on water and the filtration of water as it comes across their root tendrils. So literally millions if not billions of small root fibers are cleansing the water clean as it comes across this savanna, comes to this side of the savanna and then starts to drop down into our deep percolation aquifers. I'll tell you one thing, folks. In every single project that we worked in between 2007 and 2012, everywhere in Asia, there is one critical component to every single one of those projects. Water, drinkable water. I mean, think about it. You've been drinking water out of a bottle for how many years? We've been convinced to think that drinkable water comes in bottles. It comes from the ground, folks. And if you make sure that you take care of it in a responsible manner, you build a development within a nature reserve that controls its own water destiny, its own legacy of water security, you are that much further ahead of the game because that is a valuable, valuable service that we're protecting here at Sanctuary Belize, that the City River Wildlife Reserve and its five tight ecosystems care for and make sure that we are always have an abundant water supply. Many people ask, well, how did you decide how large the community was going to be? How do you know those resources are going to be supported? Well, interesting, just like I said before, we have a beautiful environmental impact assessment that tells us what we ex the expected um, impacts and what those mitigations might be. And what we've found from that is that you take a reverse approach. Rather than saying we want to have a community this big, do the natural resources support it? We went the opposite way. We looked at the natural resources and the provision of natural resources and how we can make sure that we only are taking what we need and no more. 
we realized then that is the scale that the community should be developed on. So the scale of this community is commensurate with what nature can provide without us influencing it into the next generation and so forth. So it's very important that we use certain factors. Certain factors like you can't take uh, your well water on your property. You can only take well water from our custom designed system of eight zones, each well providing about 100 to 150 gallons per minute. We do our water profiling four up to eight times a year. We send it up to Bellican Laboratories where they have one of the best water labs in the entire country. Those water labs give us the feedback and the baseline so that we know we're not having any impact on the, the water systems. And we're not just doing the wells either. We actually go out into the shallows, into the lagoons, into the estuaries to make sure that our outputs are not influencing the pH, the alkalinity, the, the TSS, total suspended solids, the turbidity. All these data profiles we're always measuring to make sure that one, we're only taking as much as we need, and two, that we're not having any long-term effect on this interdependent mechanical relationship that we're having with this beautiful system that is the City River Wildlife Reserve. Okay, let's talk a little bit about microeconomies and what that means for Sanctuary Belize and the City River Wildlife Reserve. So what we do here is we have somebody like Joel, who's a very gifted young Belizean man who has a background in gardening as well as design. So when it comes time for landscaping, you just stop by here. You check out which kind of varieties that you'd like. You walk the gardens with Joel. He'll do a beautiful design for your home. Of course, all these things come at a cost, but that's what supports this economy. Your community supporting this economy. This economy is resulting in people that are coming here every day, able to work 20 or 30 in jobs that they would not otherwise have. I mean, do your homework. Look at Stan Creek, Belize. It's one of the most underemployed di districts of the entire country of Belize. Why is that? Because there's really only four jobs. You can pick an orange, pack an orange, pick a banana, pack a banana. You don't have one of those jobs. You probably do not have a job in this district. So rather than having these people fleeing up to Belize City, we're providing jobs for them here. Right on the other side of the river, less than a mile away, is City River Village. We bring them over just not far from here, across the river on a little ferry boat every morning. And we also take them back at home at night. What that allows them to do is have an income here, be able to go back to their own villages and bring that prosperity back to their village. And that way they can even tuck their kids in at night. It's a beautiful story because it's the right thing to do. I can tell you, having gone to Guatemala and been asked to go and look at a beautiful development there, they wanted a green rating from our company. Uh, we went over there and my, my report started before I even entered the gate. When I got to the gate, I see a gate, of course we have security here, you have to check who's coming in and out, but it was the character of the gate. 12 foot walls that went on as far as the eye could see in both directions. Razor wire on top of those walls, and every 100 yards or so, a chap with a shotgun. That's not the type of community that we have here because we don't need it. It goes back to what I was talking about before. If we don't create an economy, people will create their own economy. They will look at you as an economy. It's called disassociation tolerance. And the way to avoid that is to do things like this. Here at this beautiful garden center, a community supported agriculture, the showcase gardens that we'll have down at the marina where you'll be able to go in, walk through these beautiful gardens, and we'll be inviting vendors from all over to come in and trade their wares, do some of their value-added crafts. That way they don't have to get on a bus and go 40 miles away and hope to sell one jar of peanut butter or one jar of Crabu jam. They'll be able to have a central location where we, as the custodians of this community, will be able to reap the benefits of all these beautiful things of Belize and then those people that are just our neighbors around us will be able to enjoy the benefits of us being here into perpetuity. Okay, here we are at one of the most important locations in the development. This lonely little pipe right here is Sapadilla Ridge Phase 2, Zone 8 Well. And uh, this is a perfect example of how our waters come across this big, beautiful savanna, scrubbed clean, dropped down into an aquifer. This particular puppy is about 60 feet down when we started wa hitting water. The base is a granite base like I have here in my hand, which makes the water what? Soft. Uh, many parts of the Caribbean, other parts of northern Belize, have lime, limestone deposits which make their water hard. Uh, in our particular area, we're on an outcrop of the Coxcomb Basin. Uh, gives us a high granite content in the water and makes our water very sweet. 
Also picks up some very nice trace minerals like magnesium and selenium, the things that our doctors are saying that we need in our drinking water and we are no longer getting because we've been convinced that drinking water comes from bottles. Uh, going back, like I said, one of the if you read the World Economic Forum report of 2014, one of the top 10 most critical resources and uh, its risks for global economy is simple as this, drinking water. And that's why we manage this so carefully. We're using state-of-the-art HDPE lines to make sure that the quality that you get at your tap is the same that's coming out of this well. The reason that we have our wells set up on this kind of a nodal system that's interconnected so that this well can support another well should another well show any kind of anomaly or have any problems with their pressure pumps, anything like that, they can cover for one another. Also, this gives us great monitoring capability. It also makes sure that we know as much water as we're consuming off of this well versus what we know this well can output. So all these things and cues that we're taking from the international community, uh, places like where back uh, my home in Annapolis, Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, who for many, many years has been advocating different manners of making sure that we take care of the estuaries and then into the water catchment out into our bays, our lagoons. We have all these interactive relationships that have to be protected. So we take things like this and we don't take them for granted. And it starts right here. There's nothing more critical than water. That's why we take such good care of it. We're so uh, cautious in how our use is and making sure we monitor it and make sure that we're adopting best practices. It's a global movement right here, folks. And we're starting it right here at Sanctuary Belize. Okay guys, I hope that has given you a little bit of context about this big, beautiful property. Uh, the value system that we're trying to incorporate at the master planning level, where it needs to be done. You can implement these things in the front end of a project like this, and the legacy of that decision making. Things like the HDPE lines, the garden center, the wood shop, these are all value added items, but they also integrate very well into something that we're trying to promote. It's simple folks, a land ethic. It's something that has been buried in our DNA for a very long time, and it's something we need to rekindle. Because since the mechanized age, we have been convinced that the only way to go about things is the conventional method of take, and not worry about nature, and thinking that nature will just continue to give indefinitely. We now know that that was a bad mistake, and that's okay, because we now have the benefit of some superior technology that the mechanized age delivered to us. And utilizing that technology and our new understanding of this deep, complex interrelationship between we as humans and nature as an entity, as a stakeholder, as something that needs to be engaged at the table and considered and how much the nature can provide without us asking too much of her. And this is what our goal is here at Sanctuary Belize, for it to actually be sanctuary, for you to be able to come back. For my young son who's seven years old, I want him to come back when he's my age and have the same, if not a better, experience here in loving and beautiful Belize. Thanks so much, enjoy your stay at Sanctuary Belize, and if you're not here, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much.